please, Madam Shandana, if you'd, if you'd like to take the floor. Hi, Imogen. Thank you so much. Uh, my apologies. I think I was supposed to make the closing remarks. However, I have another event, and I think it's such an interesting discussion, uh, but we've uh, taken a little bit of more chunk of time than I had uh, uh, calculated earlier. So if, if that's all right, I'll be uh, I'll sort of amend my closing comments to sort of fit the narrative of what's being discussed now uh, in, in, in a couple of major points. First of all, uh, thank you everyone for having us here. Thank you for hosting us. It's always useful to listen to other countries' experiences. Uh, I wear another hat, uh, not just as a leg legislator for Pakistan. I'm also the chair of the Commonwealth Women Parliamentarians. In fact, we have access to a huge amount of nation and data on what other countries are doing. Luckily, the CPA, like the IPU, is doing a lot for women parliamentarians to ensure that we have the real outreach that we need to be having in COVID. And this is an exercise nobody was prepared for. Pandemics usually people are prepared for. And so perhaps uh, listening to some of the more interesting things from uh, Ms. Guthrie, uh, from you, Imogen, as well as from Aisha, and uh, the senior clerk of New Zealand, one thing I can say that there has been two particular spate of, uh, uh, let's say, uh, law making slash policy making. Uh, not both, neither of them were directly related to COVID, but when the opportunity presented itself, we realized that this is the way we need to go. The first one working back, backwards, and we may have a joint session of the parliament tomorrow or day after, it's rather controversial, but it just highlights what happens in such pandemics or in such states of emergency. And that is that we have, uh, for Pakistan, we are on a particular task force, uh, the Financial uh, Action Task Force, and this is essentially for anti-terrorism um, bills and for uh, bills against money laundering. As you know, Pakistan has been a victim. It's funny how we've been portrayed as a country that supports terrorism, never realizing that we're a country that suffered from it. Uh, the most for the uh, nearly 15 years. So uh, as, as, as members who are on the uh, FATF watch list, we are trying to come out of the gray list uh, and we have had to amend a number of legislations, a lot of which happened to come during this COVID time. And because global economies, I wouldn't say are failing, but are crunching the latest numbers anywhere between nine and $11 trillion. And uh, that's a scary number. And thank God we haven't yet reached the proportions even of 2000, uh, 2000, 1998 and 99, and as well as 2004, with, that was just one to 3% of global economies. But right now, we're looking at least 1% of a crunch of the global economy. So in comes emergency legislation, highly controversial. We have not been able to gain much traction with the opposition. But I think that also looks at the positive side of democracy, that we have a guardian, we have the opposition, that is opposing certain legislations which are vital for Pakistan's well-being. At the same time, they sometimes make amendments, which we accept. Sometimes they make amendments we don't accept. But at least it talks about an awake legislature. And you'll see a lot of uh, noise on the floor, but that is the essence of a democracy. So that is the legislative part. It's been difficult, quite unlike the New Zealand experience, uh, where uh, we heard about the collaborative nature of things. But in Pakistan, uh, it's just the opposite for the moment. However, that also serves a purpose and an important purpose. We're a nation of 220 million people. Somebody has to keep an eye on us. And as was stated earlier, emergency legislation is just that. Regardless of the state of emergency or legal status of the emergency, you still have to keep your eyes open and it's important to have a, an active opposition. Secondly, uh, now this is coming to the good part. Um, you might be aware that Pakistan has had for many, many years a social service program called BISC, which was the Benazir Bhutto Income Support Program. And from that, nearly 4 million women were being served. However, during the pandemic, 10 days after the pandemic, and we had a lockdown, you could see the uh, impact of the lockdown all across the countryside. 66% of Pakistan's population lives in the rural areas, which means they're involved in agriculture, which means these are not necessarily educated people and they're working in the construction sector which means 66% of your population is without a job. Now that is a situation ripe for a revolution, for a social revolution, for an economic revolution. Just look at Lebanon and look at Minsk, what was happening yesterday in the middle of the COVID. Look at the United States. 
So we've been lucky. We've man managed to avoid that uh, big uh, impasse as big as the, uh, I can't, the new Grand Canyon, uh, as it were. What we did was the following. We took policy measures and four big things, and I'll explain those later. One, we launched an emergency cash transfer, different from the social cash transfer, for 12 million households. Not women, 12 million households. It's been built with longer term goals, which we've never been able to do in Pakistan for financial inclusivity for women, to bring them into the banking network. Women traditionally in the rural areas are not allowed to go alone to banks, either with their husbands they could go, with their sons, less even to shop uh, household, uh, to, to go to different markets. Um, so this was a huge thing. Thirdly, we're taking the payment system from cash-based to digital. And fourthly, beneficiaries are being encouraged to spread this in the community. Now, what was the practical result? Some of you who are familiar with banking practices may know that there's a number of measures uh, banks take when you try to open an account. They look at your ID, you know, they know your customer checks, uh, they do your background checks. Uh, there's, and what, what we've done is now, with all we've done all these background checks because families were under this impression that this is another cash transfer. They didn't realize with embedding financial inclusivity into the system. Of course, they got uh, cash transfers. That was, uh, that was a lump sum. They got nearly 75 USD. But what has happened is that women, these women are now, and men and women both, they have a limited mandate account with which they can open up a bank account anytime they wish. They actually have these uh, CNIC points, uh, which were important in Brazil. What you did was you took even your mercantile agents, you took them towards the banking system. These way people don't traditionally pay taxes. And so what you've done is, in a not so obvious way, is you've brought 12 million individuals and families and enterprises into a financial inclusivity system, which normally doesn't cater for the poor, the disenfranchised, the women, and the minorities. So this was our biggest. Now, we didn't do this through legislation because we realized the minute we take to the House, of course, there were going to be incredible uh, positive amendments to it as well. There was going to be some politicization as well. But the question was time. Do you allow 66% of your population to go starving? And I have witnessed it firsthand. I come from a village. I had to go to my area. We women reserve. I'm, I'm a, as you say, a reserve parliamentarian or, or a representative parliamentarian. And so we don't have constituencies. We have areas which are often bigger than constituencies. And I've been to nearly 800 to 1,000 households, and the misery that I saw was only mitigated by this SAS emergency cash transfer of the Prime Minister, which earlier Riyaz Fatihana Saab also mentioned. So I wanted to bring these two things to your attention, to the discussion, that unfortunately, as, as, as an ardent lover of democracy, I realized that we had difficult choices. Either we were going to bulldoze this policy, not legislation, and we were going to get the people, 66% of this country, to eat. Or we could go through parliament, we could take the necessary precautions and have the best possible law. But I guess the answer I have found is that what stops us now from making this legal? What stops us now from bringing in the requisite legislation to ensure that in the future there is transparency, there is monitoring, and there is tracking? And the best part of it, this was done apolitically. There are people from my own political party which oppose this program because it was distributing money without any political affiliation. So imagine you've brought an apolitical banking and financial inclusivity process both for women who would never have access to a bank, let alone a computer, to disenfranchised men, as well as you've brought merchants into that. So I will stop here. I'm sorry I'm not going to be able to stay any more than this, but I do hope since it's being recorded, I'm able to get a copy of this so I can see what happened after I left. Thank you all so much. Thank you.